Hello and welcome to the Cube and the Analyst Angle. We're here to have a Cube conversation. Uh, we're going to talk around data products, what they are, what they're going to be, what people and customers are really talking about. And I'm so excited to be joined today by Shinji Kim, who's from SelectStar, who she's the founder and CEO of SelectStar. And I want to say thank you for coming on. You're a Cube alumnus. You've been on at least twice before, so we're, we're excited to have you back today. And especially on this topic, because I think that you and I have seen multiple different parts of what a data product is, how the modern data stack is really evolving, and really what people should be looking for as they go out and start to have these conversations within their organizations about data products. And I, I think that that's kind of where I want to kick off is, you know, let's, let's because we may not exactly always see eye to eye on things like this, especially what a data product is. So why don't you give your perspective on what a data product is? And then we'll see you know, how close you and I agree to that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, first of all, thanks for having me here. Uh, excited to be on theCUBE again. Uh, so yeah, I think when we uh, were, uh, you know, like the, when we met last time, when we talked about data products, what we really talked about is like, at what scope of, you know, um, definition are we talking about? Um, I have noticed that some people uh, say it's data product even when you're calling it a data set, uh, which I disagreed with because I believe, and as someone who has a background in software engineering and product management, um, I believe product, if, if you are calling something as a product, it has to have uh, some type of jobs to be done, like a purpose that it's built for. And most of the time, uh, data sets uh, primarily uh, reflect a uh, state or um, uh, product or you know it could be an entity uh, at the, or you know fact at the same time uh, I believe a product needs to have either certain features or attributes different aspect that is uh, for a specific purpose so when we talk about data products well my uh, uh, definition is one level higher than just the data sets. Uh, usually something that has to do uh, with the data sets. So set of data uh, is either part of it or is uh, baked into a model, uh, could be a model. So most of the time, I feel like a lot of the data products are things like your recommendation model, fraud detection model, uh, could be personalization model, uh, designed for a specific purpose. and. Uh, because it is like a product, can be used for different features and purposes, uh, can be augmented, can be uh, iterated and uh, applied in different places. So yeah. that's no, my definition. I think, that, I think that's a great way to look at it. I, I, my, with myself being a product guy, right, a product person, uh, I look at it as it has to be, you have to be able to do something with it. There has to be some value you get out of that product. There's something I can achieve with that product. Uh, and then, I, to your point about going up the next level up, it's kind of, a, is, that a, is that a data product feature or is that a data product itself? Does it stand alone? And I start to look at it as, you know, some people say, well, once you get to visualization, maybe then it's a data product. I think visualization is a way to consume the product, potentially. I could argue both sides of that fence, but where do you come down on what what is usable? Because if it's a feature, like like you said, fraud detection model, let's mm -hmm. sit there. Fraud detection, I think, is pretty good as a product because it it tells you that there's fraud or there's not fraud, and there's usable, and it's consumable. I think there's things like recommendations engines mm -hmm. that could be theoretically hey, it gives me a recommendation, but is that a product or is that part of a product as part of a site that I sell something on? Sure, I mean, that's why I say this is a data product. It's uh, something that can be baked into a feature, mm -hmm. uh, like at the you know, footer of your website, or it could be uh, part of the app. Um, so I, I feel like a lot of data products uh, have a lot of applications of where it can get attached to. Um, and because of that, it may not be, it, that itself may not be a product uh, 
Right. Yeah, that may not it itself it may not be a product feature, but then it powers the product feature, and and that's what we why we call it, um, I guess, yeah, data Good product. product. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I I think that's why I I keep going back and forth with data product versus data product feature, and I, I think the word feature seems to be mo missing in our hierarchy of that's of true that. and also once you yeah. when when we say feature that is also a very like ambiguous word because we use feature for like machine learning models like which yeah. features are we using right so uh, let's not get confused about that <laughs> um, but regarding product development perspective um, the other aspect of uh, this uh, data uh, product is just more of like uh, like the the other aspect is data applications because like I think that is another type of or can be uh, considered as a data product whenever we uh, you know like if it's a very simple application we call it CRUD application right you uh, user is entering all the data and the application is giving you back uh, all the the data that has been entered by all different types of users whereas data applications um, is a, you know, I guess by default is a CRUD application, but uh, it can have more than that. Like it will analyze or it will, you know, run some models on top of the data that's been already entered and then give you a different um, results. So I think when the data products are being utilized, it usually powers data applications. Yeah, no, I, and that, I. See, I love that. See, I, I love that we're talking about as we build data products, you're really building a data app. And the data app then gets exposed in some way, shape, or form to whatever the end you, whoever or whatever the end user may be. Mm -hmm. And I think to me, that was, I, I think that's, it, I think it's a still evolving hierarchy of this because, again, what if, because here's, here's the one that th always throws kind of a wrench at me is when I say, okay, I built this data product. And then somebody goes, well, I took your data product, I took a subset of your data product, I took another complete data product, and I've joined them together to make that third data product that's up in the hierarchy built on top of two different data products. Now, how it's, it, does that mean I built a, a super data product? <laughs> or is it like, you know, I took these features of these data products and started them? <laughs> I would say rather than a hierarchy, it's yeah. more of a decoupled way of looking at it because you can always take different components out of the data product and then like make other products. Uh, just like, you know, in software, you can take different modules and create a new application. Right. Um, but the uh, aspect of this like data application, I feel like, yeah, is also not necessarily like subset or the superset of others, but uh, more or less of a decoupled uh, way. Like uh, data applications have or uh, will have data sets always. Uh, does it ha does it utilize or uh, work with a data product? Uh, I think that's like the kind of like the next the, the question here. And yeah. I, I think it does. It's it's more of like because when I think about data apps, uh, this is kind of the uh, whole like you know veto and a lot of other uh, application uh, internal applications that mm -hmm. are also built on top of you know any databases um, and uh, in a way how a lot of the data on Snowflake is also moving to uh, with the Snowflake acquisition of with Scribnet. Yeah, no, I I think that it's a very interesting in how and I, and I was talking to. Uh, some people, I was at a DBT community meetup and we were talking about data products and mm. uh, some of the end users of DBT were there uh, and they were talking about how they're, they're building their data products within their companies. Ah. And they started to get into, hey, to your point about trans, uh, you know, actually transforming that data once you have it and where did it become a data product to your point earlier, it's not just a data set, it's I transformed the data into a data product. In their case, they were using DBT Core, but they transformed it and modeled it in a I certain way. I think that's way. actually, we're now getting to the notion of data as a product. So treating data and treating data team uh, to be more equipped with product management mm -hmm. mindset and a software engineering principle so that you are um, 
maintaining like the you know inheritance or the structure of the data uh, you are you know defining requirements <laughs> of like data models things like that um, I mean the, you were talking to like end users of DBT yeah uh, yeah, I, yeah. I yeah like uh, one of the companies and I, I think they're out there as a reference was rapid seven who's there and developing their okay. in, their applications that they then sell to their end user customers mm -hmm. and they happen to use DBT core underneath underneath the hood their data team does Got it. Yeah. and I think what was interesting about it and I think it goes back to treating it as a product and having uh, data product managers yeah. as part of the team and really starting to say here's the you know working backwards from the customer here's the requirements that I have what they need we have to figure out the best way to present that data to them so that they can then and that customer is an internal customer yep. who could be the UI team, it could be the yeah. analysis team. I mean, in a way, uh, that uh, aspect of what is the business needs and hence oh, how should the data model be designed or how should the data be represented uh, for the you know decision we want to drive for or analysis that we want to do, I think has always been the job of data analysts uh, and data teams overall. But um, I think this introduction of uh, and I do see a lot more of data product managers, data platform product managers. Uh, this, I think, it, uh, is adding a more kind of like center of excellence type of layer where the data product managers can see not just like uh, one aspect of the request, but multiple requests, and then hence being able to uh, taking a lot of those into consideration of data modeling, but also how they can maintain so that they can reuse the data model that they already have, and there is a good data contract uh, around how they can be uh, used and added or changed. I think that's all where that data as a product uh, really comes in. Yeah, no, I, I think that to me makes so much sense. I, I think that it it's a treating it as a product. In fact, I was, uh, I forgot, I was down in New York City two weeks ago for meeting with a whole number of different data teams there and some venture capital folks that were investing in different, mm -hmm. uh, I guess you could say startups. And uh, it was sponsored by Alex Hutchins, who's a, uh, runs a uh, recruiting firm called DataWorks. And they okay. specialize in recruiting in data teams into corporations. And so a lot of the teams we were talking with were really trying to wrap their hands around how they get a product focused type of mentality into their companies because I think they see it as a challenge that, you know, I, I'm a product manager at heart and I, I get it and I understand how you, how you formulate the requirements, but that doesn't come naturally to, to data teams. Mm. How, do you, how do you see that, that people are, addressing it. I'm seeing people recruit in people who are more like me uh -huh. that are have been, you know, product managers, but maybe not even in the domain that that company is working in. Got it. Yeah, I guess it, if I were to try to think about the, um, like the history or the experience of other data product managers that I've worked with in the past, and, you know, obviously these are mostly through select star because I would say it's fairly new roles in a lot of companies. Um, I think a lot of them do come from more data analyst background. Mm -hmm. uh, where And this is just something that I find from a lot of data leaders. They uh, initially start in the position of supporting the business uh, by presenting and analyzing, uh, helping making business decisions with data. Uh, but as they start doing a lot more of those work, they they try to uh, you know optimize and make their pro their own internal processes better. And I think uh, you know taking a like a significant step towards that is uh, looking at and say that we should treat data as a product. Hence, 
we should have a way to manage data better, we should catalog them, we should put uh, contracts in place, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, whenever there is a request of data, th these are the processes that they should go through. Um, you know, like if there will be like a transformation layer, uh, like or like if the data uh, lands on uh, this database, like it, it, it should have this L SLA, like all, all, all of those stuff I think um, comes from a uh, lot of people that are already ingrained in data as a data engineer or data analyst, but are starting to really think about all, like, or being exposed to all different ways that the data needs to be used. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I still think it's something that a um, lot of, you know, data analysts and data engineers can move into. Um, it does require kind of branching out on, you know, talking to more end users and um, learning more about the domain level uh, knowledge, uh, you know, outside of just, you know, optimizing SQL queries. I yeah, think. no, I, 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 think it, I think it is one of those, how do you train people up into being that product management mm -hmm. mindset versus how do you bring people in and can you teach them the data, data aspect? Ah. And I, I think uh, I, I even, when I was at uh, Manulife Financial and John Hancock Insurance in the US way back in the day when I was in the internal IT, so this is before we had this, I worked with the actuarial group and we had a grid of, of computers where we would do the numbers and come up mm -hmm. with all the science behind it and all that fun stuff before it was called AI uh, back in the day. And what I needed to be able to help them build out that grid and build out the abilities and capabilities to run their algorithms to actually come up with those numbers. I need, but me knowing the business was more important than me knowing the data science behind it at right. the time. So I think it's, you're gonna find that, that it's gonna be an interesting, I guess you could say, uh, thing to see how this grows out because I think that data teams really need to have that business focus. And I, I think some do and some don't, like mm. every software group, you can always see it and very, well, who wants to be into the business, who doesn't want to be into the business. Okay, yeah, I think a lot of data people do, especially people that are, you know, uh, facing the stakeholders and providing those insights and uh, analysis. Um, I also think that it is important uh, for more uh, business stakeholders and domain uh, uh, stakeholders to uh, start being more familiar with the data models and how uh, their analysis gets put together. Um, and I think that's kind of like the, the only way to really reduce the gap in order for both data team and business team to collaborate well. I agree, I agree. So what, what's new with SelectStar? What's going on? Everything good? <laughs> yeah, SelectStar is good. Uh, it's been busy. Uh, so, you know, we just came, I guess, you know, I can't believe it's already like a week ago, but <laughs> yeah, from Snowflake Summit and Databricks AI Summit, uh, which have been really amazing shows. Um, we launched two major new features. Uh, first one is AI documentation. So we used to have automated documentation. So AI is just uh, kind of additive on top of that. Our original automated documentation was about um, filling in uh, all the descriptions of mm -hmm. columns and tables whenever uh, we see either duplicated tables or uh, whenever we recognize any data that's been uh, transferred as is, uh, because that's something, uh, one of the details that our uh, column level lineage will track. So you can, um, basically write documentation uh, once and then we can apply it all in everywhere else. Uh, so that's what we had, but uh, it still does require some effort for data teams to write some documentation in order for us to propagate that all. Uh, now with the uh, you know amazing developments in LLMs and all, we wanted to try out uh, what would it be like if we were to have AI to write documentation from scratch, if there was like no um, human uh, documentation whatsoever. What are the aspect of uh, context and the prompts we can give in order to get uh, somewhat of a, uh, you know, 80% plus guesstimates of, uh, you know, column documentation we can do. 
Um, because in a way, a lot of uh, table column level uh, uh, like names, which is like required than the comments, uh, like the description side, uh, is already descriptive enough. Uh, and we also, uh, given that we process so much metadata, one part that uh, we saw as one of the key is the uh, SQL query that creates those tables. Because uh, now with DBT and all the transformation layer, you can actually see how each table or view or reporting layer is getting generated. So um, uh, it was really uh, cool to see how close we can get, uh, even when there is uh, like no prior documentation whatsoever. And now we can help our customers to uh, really kickstart their data documentation and data dictionary uh, without um, having to, like it's really more of like going to uh, basically review the documentation that AI have written for you. And then uh, as you start augmenting them, uh, you can make rest of your documentation much richer and more accurate. Yeah. yeah, we see that with AI all the time, especially with anywhere LLMs are being applied from a specific or segmented language model type of uh, deal that it's always enhancing what the people are doing. So how close can I get and then augment uh, yeah. with the knowledge, which makes total sense. Yeah, so this is like uh, just a baby step towards like adding more uh, f features and functionalities using AI, but um, I'm really excited to continue uh, embedding AI into other places in Select Star as well. Um, the other feature that we also released is Snowflake cost analysis. Uh, a lot of our customers, especially on the enterprise side, they are uh, huge customers of Snowflake. And uh, because we manage all of their metadata, uh, one of the things that we have uh, always gotten asks for is uh, what the usage of the data means to them in terms of the spending on uh, their cloud data warehouses. So uh, we felt like this is a, a also very interesting angle. With lineage and popularity, we can tell you based on the um, uh, dependencies like this is a uh, table that's being queried a lot, but it's queried by this Tableau dashboard. And uh, uh, we can let you know if that Tableau dashboard is actually being viewed by your business stakeholders, right? right? Because if it's not, then what's the point of keep updating that table? Um, and uh, similarly, in terms of the cost perspective, we wanted to show uh, somewhat of that relationship of this table is being utilized a lot. And, um, and hence, it is definitely worthwhile of uh, this much of a cost. But here is a um, table that is uh, being queried by you know, different aspect, uh, and it is very expensive. But is it actually being utilized uh, like in terms of popularity? Are there a lot of people using it? Or is it just some people that's writing very bad queries? <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. Like that yeah. type of uh, anomalies, it's being able to see those an anomalies uh, is one part. And then for, uh, in general, companies that are looking to optimize and manage their cloud data warehouse costs better, the first step of managing your uh, cost is by just you know slicing and dicing the data by uh, uh, putting it in, into how you can segment them by user by team by warehouse by um, uh, your dashboards or tables or queries uh, so like it's basic level uh, uh, segmentation at the same time when you start doing that you can start seeing um, the like which are the top most uh, queries that are driving most of the costs. Uh, yeah. What time of the day or day of the week is causing this on like which warehouse? So these types of uh, insights are, I would say also first steps, but uh, is very interesting to a lot of our customers. So uh, very excited to roll that out. Yeah. And uh, we are extending that to uh, dashboards level. Uh, so that's also uh, yeah interesting because uh, most of the, uh, I think cost related part, like, you know, Snowflake themselves also have released a new feature. Right. Um, they called it S S S K I or something like that. Um, yeah, or S P I or Snowflake yeah. like something index. Yeah. Right. Performance <laughs> index. Right. Um, uh, for us, it's really to 
show not just on the table level, but also uh, based on the application. How much is this application costing you on Snowflake? How much is this specific dashboard costing you on Snowflake? Things like that. No, that's, that's I, I think, fantastic. And I, I think you also hit on one another topic we'll have to circle back around on another time, but around uh, data contracts. And oh, cause yeah. That's okay. a whole nother, we could, we, we will probably spend, <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll another get together <laughs> yes, and have another episode on that. But I really appreciate you coming on board and, and sharing your perspective. I, I think it's going to be a continued conversation around data products. And I really, you know, thank you very much, Shinji, for joining me. And I thank you all for watching and joining us here on theCUBE where we're breaking out the signal from the noise and really bringing you what is going on especially here on the analyst angle. Thank you, take care.